All right. Well, welcome everybody to another edition of our weekly journalist roundtable for uh, June 5th, 2020. This is Bob Ambrogi and uh, I will be uh, once again serving as a moderator today and the host today. Uh, this has been, uh, as everybody knows, a, a, a tough week uh, and uh, it almost seems besides the point to be talking about legal technology, I think for some of us, but it's a, a week when issues of race and injustice have dominated the news and dominated our thoughts. And uh, it's of course a painful reality. I think that the legal tech industry, uh, broadly speaking, has a, a diversity problem of its own. One, I don't know that we talk enough about. I know that in 2018, uh, Kristen Sande, a co-founder of Paladin did a, a study uh, of diversity among founders in legal tech uh, when she found that uh, black and Latinx founders account for a staggeringly low proportion of legal tech entrepreneurs, just 2.3% and 3.1% uh, respectively. Um, I'm also uh, uh, aware that uh, this this panel uh, has a diversity problem. Uh, we've we've been meeting for a few weeks now, and and if you uh, look at the composition of this panel, uh, uh, we we clearly have a diversity problem, and, and and that's that's my fault. I'm to blame for that. I'm the one who who's invited the people to be part of this panel, and I certainly uh, want everybody to know that I'm I'm sorry about that, and I I pledge that we're going to do our our best to remedy that going forward. Um, but in light of the week's news, what we've done is something a little bit different today, which was that we've invited a, a guest who is himself a, a co-founder and CEO of a legal tech startup. And it, it's a legal tech startup that uh, is very much focused on uh, diversity in the legal industry. Uh, and it's also, he ha also happens to be the uh, author of, of an article that he published this week on, on the American Lawyer entitled What the Death of George Floyd Should Teach the Legal Industry. So uh, welcoming to our panel, uh, Brian Parker. Brian, how are you? Good, Bob. Thanks for having me in and uh, for this conversation. Yeah. And, and we're going to get back to Brian in just a second, but let's just do our, our usual uh, quick go around of introductions here so we all know uh, who's here. Uh, Nikki Black, you want to start? Sure. Uh, I'm Nikki Black. I am the legal technology evangelist with my case. That essentially means I am the bridge between lawyers and technology internally and externally. Externally, I am a journalist, uh, write a lot about, uh, a legal tech journalist of sorts. I write on a lot of different platforms, including ABA Journal, Above the Law, The Daily Record, and the My Case blog. Zach? Uh, hey there, everybody. My name is Zach Warren. I'm the editor-in-chief of ALN's Legal Tech News, um, anything at the intersection of law and technology for the company that also has the American Lawyer, Corporate Counsel, and other publications under our umbrella. And let's see, Caroline. Hi there. I'm Caroline Hill, editor-in-chief of Legal IT Insider. I'm based in the, in the UK, but with global coverage. Um, and as I always say, AKA, we're known as the Orange Rack. <laughs> right. Joe. Uh, yeah, Joe Patrice from Above the Law. Um, I have nothing really fun to add to that, actually, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah, I feel, I feel like I'm letting everybody down with that one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, everybody else has like cool, like, oh, and this and this and this. And I'm like, oh, above the law. Like, but you've you know. got a dinosaur on your show. I was gonna uh, say. There is a dinosaur. Yes, there is a dinosaur. So, now it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And last but never least, Molly McDonough. I'm Molly McDonough. I'm a, a media consultant and uh, former editor and publisher of the ABA Journal, um, blogging about uh, legal affairs issues, especially access to justice at a just society. Um, and I will push back on your statement about uh, legal tech and uh, the issues of, of today, uh, because especially in the access to justice area, technology is one of the, the most important tools to, um, that we can use to um, decrease barriers, increase access, um, and, and scale lower cost legal services. So that's where my focus is. 
Yeah, well, I, I'm not sure you're disagreeing with me. I, I, I was just really talking more about the composition of some of the, the uh, especially the, 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 among the founders and the management and even the, the people who work in legal tech. Um, you go to uh, ABA Tech Show or you go to uh, some of the conferences and, and there is, a, there is a, a real diversity issue, I think. But, but uh, Brian, uh, maybe you could, I mean, you could probably talk to that a little bit, but maybe you could just set the stage for us by telling us who you are and what you do. Yeah, so so I don't have a cool dinosaur in the in the mm -hmm. background, but uh, that when you rip this you know uh, virtual background away, I've got a cool painting. So maybe next time, <laughs> um, you know, I look. Um, I think most of us are in some level of angst, uh, sadness, uh, anger, trying to make sense of what's been going on this last week and a half since we all saw on uh, national TV. Uh, George, uh, George Floyd got murdered at the hands of the police. And, and so where, where does that bring us? Um, uh, I'm a black CEO, obviously we can, we, we can see that. Um, I started in law at Sherman and Sterling uh, in the M&A group. Uh, I did investment banking uh, for about eight years. Uh, tech, was, uh, tech was my area. Uh, and then I've been on operations, uh, in operations, excuse me, uh, for over the last decade. Um, as a CEO of a venture back tech company before moving to DC to found this with uh, John Greenblatt, um, who, was, who was my mentor way back as a summer associate when I was still at NYU. So, you know, maybe we'll talk about the power of mentoring and that sort of thing. Um, I think for the, what I'd just like to say is a quick introduction um, is for a lot of uh, the black associates, partners, uh, your friends, uh, that sort of thing. This this moment, you know, it feels like a, a culmination, right? Because a lot of people have said, "What's different about where we are?" Right? We've we've we had the same reaction with Trayvon Martin and um, and Mike Brown and the whole uh, the whole lineage. I think people are um, have reached a breaking point of sorts. And so, it might sound odd that as a, a lawyer, and particularly an MA one, I start off with a very touchy feely uh, statement saying that your black colleagues and friends are, are not all right, right? So when I sat down, part of writing the piece was to have some cathartic event for myself personally and for some of my friends. As I started talking about it with my business partner, we said there may be some lessons here that we can share with the broader industry. Um, we, as, as far as, as, as the legal industry, I think we've got two challenges, Bob, and you talked about the diversity. Diversity and inclusion cuts, our, I think, across a lot of different, you know, avenues in, in our industry. And I think we should talk about that. But I also, as we go on in the piece to talk about, I think that the legal industry, and I take Molly's point, um, because of technology, I think we can democratize uh, a lot of processes and give access to where people didn't have them before. Um, so, but lawyers have, in I think, in our midst, uh, a lot of privilege, uh, a lot of access to resources, and just a lot of know-how. And for the people that did go to, to law school, my challenge, uh, my colleagues, many of us wrote on those statements way back when, when we were trying to go to law school, well, I wanna make a difference in the world, I wanna save, I wanna give a voice to the, to, to the voiceless. I don't make fun of those things. I said some of the similar things. And so I guess I asked the question, is our industry may, maybe, you know, uh, position as the first amongst equals to try to pick up this uh, to try to pick up this mantle and I'll, I'll just close the opening point with um, many of you have read a lot of what Baldwin wrote and this particular um, uh, I think it was in the late 50s it was at a debate in Cambridge uh, and coming out of that he made the quote that a lot of people have, have hung on to um, saying that to be black in America is to be in a constant state of rage so if when you're looking out and, and the first challenge is, right, like we try to understand then be understood, as we're trying to go through and wrestle with our own emotions, I think the first thing that we need to do for our colleagues, for our friends, for our workplaces, uh, is to look at the humanity of the situation and just realize what people are going through. Try to talk that out. Let's try to do some healing. And then we have some very specific um, steps. And again, we don't claim, I don't claim, and John doesn't claim to be the experts on any of this, but we do think that there needs to be a real frank and direct dialogue uh, about what is a very thorny subject 
um, so that we can get about making progress. I want to uh, just invite my fellow panelists here to, to go ahead and, and, and chime in if, if you have points or, or questions you want to raise. But I, I, just, just to follow up on what you were saying, one thing I wanted to ask Brian, I mean, we, we, there, there does, it does somehow feel like a turning point. Uh, and, and yet I'm old enough to have been at a few places along my life when it's felt like a turning point and then somehow things fall back into the way they were. And how, how do we make sure this really is a turning point. Uh, how do we keep this momentum going, whether in the legal profession or, or, or more broadly? Yeah, um, so, so I think that that's the question of the hour, right? Um, and that's why I think it's a twofold challenge. It's a challenge for industry, but I think we have a, a broader challenge to be a part of a solution uh, in society. Um, the short answer is I don't know. Right. Um, so my mom uh, grew up in the rural um, south. She was uh, in a town about two hours outside of Atlanta. And she was the first person, the, the area is called uh, Rome, Rome, Georgia, for anybody that knows that area. Um, and she was the first person of color, a uh, black, uh, black child, uh, to integrate uh, her uh, high school there um, in, in East Rome, Georgia. And that was an incredibly tough uh, you know, process for her. Made, made the strides, graduated college, uh, got, a, uh, got a master's degree, helped raise two kids largely uh, on her own. And I remember a point in 2000, I guess it was 2008, going into whatever the uh, election results were announced, I think it was the end of 08 when uh, Barack was uh, president. And I just remember standing, stepping out of the party that I was at um, uh, and, and just hearing her crying and joining in the crying and saying, uh, for, for this now, 73-year-old, 72-year-old black woman. I never thought I'd see this in my lifetime, right? Well, we're a short 10, 12 years later, and we're in the same lifetime, and maybe we've given back that support. And that's why I said, I don't know. But the question that we have to, uh, one of the questions I think are in the series of questions, how do we um, look at the apparatus in society and drive systemic change? How, when we stop looking at CNN and reading the newspapers and all the great stuff that, that this group is putting out, do we make sure that people are still focused on the work so that it's not just a moment in time where we see people marching and we, uh, we have this crisis of conscience as a country and as an industry, and we, and we don't you know, look up in another four or eight years uh, and there's not been the progress. So I think it's the healing. I think it's the conversation. I think it's the direct points of action that we're all thinking about. But I'm a, you know, sort of a big data and accountability person as a leader. What are those, um, how are we going to measure this progress? How are we going to have checkpoints? How are we going to hold each other accountable so that when we do look back, um, we, can, we can come up, we can, we can say four years, 10 years, whatever it was hey, we made progress in this area. And the first thing that we used to do, um, I ran a billion dollar division at a, a big healthcare company called DeVita. And, and um, we used to say, look, put your results up there and no explanation until after you explain the results, right? So it's, here are my six metrics, either I met them or I didn't. Now, when we, when we finish those, then we can go back and we can say this happened and this happened. But I think unless we are um, willing to engage uh, with brutal honesty and willing to commit to accountability, no more, you know, sort of squishy platitudes and that sort of thing. Um, I'm not sure how the change, how, how we don't look up in another four years and, and there's unfortunately another uh, um, uh, George Floyd or, or Trayvon or they name it Breonna Taylor, right? I mean, women are not immune from this uh, at all. Um, in our community, they, they've been the leaders. So, you know, they're getting the short end of the stick and they're having to do uh, a lot of the work. So, um, we, we, we've got we've got a lot of work uh, to do, but I think if we're committed, and I'm sorry to go on. Uh, last point I'll say is that I think it will take, like you said, the opposite of your comment where you said we need more diversity. I'm actually glad that we have a group that looks like this, and I hope that the audience uh, listening is made up like this as well. And I say that for this point, we need allies that are going to help make the change. Right, no matter how loud we scream as black people. Um, we can't make the change alone. And, it, you know, I'm, I'm sure most people have seen it or, or remember it from their civics lessons of uh, Ben Franklin saying, we don't get to this change um, until the people that are 
unaffected care as much about it as the people that are affected. Do any of the... Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I'll just jump in on, on something Ryan said that, it, that I think is um, uh, important here. And, and that's the, I mean, so much of it is, but um, one point that, that I think I want to emphasize is the, the, folk, the change being a big focus on solutions and not a lot of talk and hypotheticals. Um, it's this these last this uh, these last few months with covid and then um and then the protests and demonstrations have really um laid bare a lot of the the um problems and made clear to so many what some of the solutions are um and and there's just no excuse at this point um and there wasn't an excuse before but i see more resolve and emphasis on solutions I say that and then what the next horror story comes on my TV or my, my feed. So I want to be optimistic, um, but I am seeing kind of more collaboration, more solutions oriented discussions um, and action, especially in the courts uh, and added necessity. I think it's a really interesting point about, but I mean, there's, there's so many different things to think about, but so, and I really like your point, Brian, about the metrics and, and Molly, you know, definitely take your point about, let's not just talk, but what, one, one positive step already, I think, is that I think the legal sector is definitely, definitely silent on the topic of race often, like, I think that there has not been anywhere near enough conversation, and although conversation is just the starting point, I think it's you know, that, that I, I think that just the fact that law firms have come out with some meaningful statements, um, and I was quite impressed by United Lex. Um, Dan Reed, the CEO, posted um, a letter that he'd sent to all of the employees. Not just, I mean, it, it was it was talking about it, but it, uh, but um, goes to perhaps Brian your point about um, commitments, and he, they they say you know they just discuss how they're moving forward, who they're supporting, which organisations they're they're supporting and how they're trying to make a difference. Um, and I've seen, I've been quite encouraged by that. Um, and I think, but I think that this for me has been um, a challenging week in all sorts of ways in that trying to work out how we can help and how we yes. position it. Because for me personally, so um, it's been a heartbreaking week and I made this point on social media um, very genuinely, you know, and um, someone, <laughs> quite fairly really with times like shot kind of shot me down and said it's not about you <laughs> you know we don't care if you're heartbroken it's not about you and I was like oh my god I don't so I think we can all learn from each other as to how we should be making a difference because those of us who are well-meaning maybe don't get it right you know and, and I think that it's for all of us to try to help educate each other and by having conversations like this I find it really helpful yeah, if I, I, I don't want to cut others off. I do want to make a quick response to that, Caroline. And first, you know, uh, I shouldn't say obviously, thank you for the, for the empathy and, and pouring your heart out. I think as a part of these conversations and, and, and well, John, uh, my co-founder and I were on a, um, the Three Geeks podcast uh, yesterday, okay? And so we did it very, I mean, with their permission, but we did it very intentionally, right? Um, John is white Jewish guy. I'm you know, who, who I am. And Carolyn, this goes to your point of hard, brutal conversations, but what John and I say, and we have a history, right? So it's a little bit easier, but we wanted to show if it's possible with us, it's possible with a larger group. And that is that people have to have a safe space. They have to be able to speak their unmitigated truths, right? So you're in pain. Yeah, great. We're not going to dispute that. Um, you have some, um, um, some things to offer. Maybe you say, well, what about this or what about that? We have to speak truth to power and in the, la I mean, as a leader, the last thing that I'll uh, allow to happen is have anybody come to the table and be shouted down in the way that you were uh, on social media? Because I think uh, what that does is that we have people that are maybe on the edge and you're not on the edge I and mean, you're an ally and you wanna, you, know, you wanna help, but people that are on the edge get that kind of feedback or they say the wrong word or they are already nervous and then they retreat. So by retreating, we don't have as full a conversation as possible. Do I think that um, I talk about top down and bottom up leadership and when we get into the law firm, 
uh, clearly, uh, let's just say I went into the law firm tomorrow and they're like, okay, you're a great guy, you know M&A, you can bring in some clients or whatever, great. Am I gonna be the senior partner the next day? No, so there's still gonna be some top-down management. My point of the movement more generally is that um, we have to let uh, a bunch of the black voices lead. In our hierarchical stru uh, structures of law firm, we have to listen to the black voices and let them be a part of the solution, not just create it in a vacuum and then force it down. That won't work. But there has to be room for everybody uh, in this struggle because we just create better outcomes when we have people at the table. And by the way, we're talking about black people in particular right now because of George Floyd. When we talk about diversity and inclusion, I'm talking to the three women that are here. We have stuff strives to go there too, right? So um, I, I would make the same comment as a man. When we're talking about inclusion on, on that side, um, I should be able to say and voice my uh, authentic opinion, um, but there should be women that are at the front leading and making the solutions and us having this conversation. I think respect is the word that we always talk about, respecting the viewpoints and the voice that people are bringing to the table. And if we can do that, uh, I was, uh, la last, last point, the, I went to NYU for law school and uh, the associate, oh, okay, <laughs> fellow alum on the, on the I, I knew if I did enough of these, I'd find one out there, so that's good. Um, so I was talking to our uh, associate dean of placement and she says, God, I've been thinking about this. I've read your piece three times since it came out. We sent it to the student body uh, and maybe some of that is because, because I'm an alum. We were getting on the phone and she called it 10.07. Um, uh, at night to talk about some, I mean, she's in charge of placement, right? So we were going to, we were talking about our model and students and that sort of thing. Didn't touch on it. One point, Carolyn, this goes to you. I felt in that moment that I had an ally. She had talked about her daughter and, um, you know, which is pretty much a, a, a very white suburb in, in, in New York, made a Black Lives Matter sign, put it in the yard and said, I want you to know all are safe here. And it's a moment that made her mom both proud and sad that she had to put that up. But Irene and I had this conversation where there was more healing. Um, we will come back and we're scheduled on Monday to talk about the business and talk about strategies. Um, but sorry, I probably am overstating this. I think we all have a voice and the voices that come to the table need to be respected because the marginal ones that may lean into this um, they're going to scatter the moment that they're shouted down or said that they're not using the right words or whatever. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. One thing I really like about the put out all your metrics, like argument, like framing of it that uh, you put up is that one conversation that I often have with folks is that one of the problems with activism and allyship is that part of bringing a lot of people together is you usually strategically focus around one goal, which yeah. tends to be a floor. Uh, and then after that floor is achieved, it can lose some steam. Yeah. And so having multiple vectors basically of dealing with these issues, uh, it's not, uh, you know, having cops extrajudicially murder people is obviously a floor, but when that gets solved, that doesn't mean that we have solved, you know, advancement within law firms, which is a problem too. And it may seem insignificant compared to the other, but all of these vectors have to kind of be attacked at once. And we can't lose sight of the fact that they all are part of taking on a superstructure kind of. So I really like that multiple metrics kind of argument for trying to bring people to this fight going forward. Yeah, and, and one of the ways I try to lead, Joe, I think it's beautifully said. Um, I went to a, a course at the Stanford Business School years ago, and they talk about setting big, bold, audacious goals. So every time we're doing something with our team, we have goals, we have metrics, but one of them, and I see, you know, Zach kind of was, was smiling a little bit, um, I throw it out, and if I don't have a goal that makes somebody like sit back in their chair like, oh God, this guy's at it again, right? Well. Maybe it's one out of 30 times or whatever the percentage is, but to your point, um, if you're not at some point looking to see how high your ceiling is, then we're gonna rise as, only as far as the, as the floor. So, um, well, well said. Yeah. yeah, when it comes to metrics, that's something that has popped up in our reporting. It almost seems like it's a chicken or the egg scenario of if you're a legal tech provider, 
you're not being asked for these metrics, so you're not putting them together. But on the other side, uh, corporate clients or what have you are saying, yeah, we're not asking for these metrics because people aren't putting them together. We don't know what data they have. They don't know what data they have. So it's a matter of somebody actually taking the initiative. And um, it's a story I actually don't think it's out yet. But one of our reporters talked to somebody who did exactly what you were saying, Brian, and said, okay, so we said 40%, that is our goal for diverse staff. If you don't have it, you're not going to work with us. And he learned very quickly that the providers were able to get those numbers together if they had initiative. So it's just a matter of somebody actually taking that first step. Yeah. And, and one of the points, that, you know, given that you guys are uh, focused on tech law, the, the last company that I was at was, a, you know, SaaS marketing. And I think that there's room uh, for the emergence of a, you know, sort of a SaaS legal provider. And just imagine like the, the conference legal week that we were all at. Um, we have studies that show that every time you're at one of those conferences, we get 186 different points of data, right? Only a subset of those are, are, are actionable. So we create reports, we uh, get that to the decision makers, whether it's the chief marketing officer, CFO, CEO kind of thing. And imagine that in a world um, of law that you're saying, especially in a world that's gonna go more remote, um, here's where my employees are. This is how productive they are. This is who's at whatever percent uh, of utilization. This is the profit, you know, all of the targets and that sort of thing. And I think you got to, um, law is a, and this is probably an understatement, a very traditional business. So when you get um, alternative legal service providers, you talked about United Lex, there's, you know, uh, Elevate and others uh, that, that are trying to push the thinking but it's a slow progress to innovation. So I think your point uh, is a smart one about, well, two, two points. Um, what is the data that's actionable and putting that in front of people and saying, oh, wow, like, yeah, this, this is, this is kind of cool. And then getting folks used to, and, and we're changing, right? We're in the middle of the shift where um, folks that had John's agent experience are still leading, but they're starting to retire. And then me, my, you know, being the next generation that are coming up and certainly the one that's behind me are a lot more tech and, and um, uh, uh, tool savvy. So how do we get people used to using the devices, using the data, um, informing that behavior? Because I had that experience. One of the things that, that we're doing in the background is thinking about a lot of AI and machine learning as it can inform the hiring process. But there's actionable data that I know that the people in charge of law firms can use. So we're going to have an app that will come out um, at some point. I won't give a, a, a date to put pressure on our developer, but we're going to have an app that will come out that will start with, uh, here's the client, here are the, you know, all the constituencies, here's, here's our students. So it'll start getting people used to seeing the app. Um, um, seeing the reports and from there we can build on we can customize and that sort of thing um, but I do think um, data for data's sake makes people's eyes roll back if you can give data that I can use this is telling me a story and I can better run my business or achieve an objective here we're talking about diversity and inclusion those are the kinds of things that I think people will gravitate to and be sticky but you've got to do it within the psychology of innovation of, of these law firms and corporations. Corporations a little bit faster, law firms a little bit slower, but that doesn't mean they, they won't come along. Brian, on, on that issue of, of diversity, I know that your company is focused on uh, helping to uh, build enhanced diversity within law firms. But a, as somebody who has been a, a serial entrepreneur, do you have any thoughts on, on how the legal tech industry it can do a better job of, of diversifying the ranks of the people who are coming up in the industry, I, you know, on, on the industry yeah. side, uh, the, 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 as I said earlier, the, the statistics show startlingly low numbers of people of colors who have been founders of legal tech companies. Uh, how do you, how do you begin to remedy that? How do you begin to increase the diversity of people who are working in these companies and, and building these companies? Yeah, well, God, I wish I, if I had the perfect answer, I'd be a lot richer than I am. That could be your second startup. Yeah, they, thank you. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll put that one in the, in the background. Well, look, you know, I guess, in, and I'd love to hear what other people think. I have uh, some perspective on this, right? Because I spent a lot of my career in Silicon Valley uh, as a banker uh, and, then, and then working in tech companies. And we've seen this, right? We saw 
um, consumers drive change at some of the big tech companies, um, uh, Facebook, and Google, and LinkedIn, and saying, well, wait a minute, you're driving a disproportionate um, percentage of your revenue from this community, right? Um, but we don't see any black engineers, uh, startup founders, all the things that, that, that you're saying. Um, I, think, I don't think that the startup in Silicon Valley and the startup legal community sort of larger, and especially on the East Coast, is, is, is all that different. Or across the, the pond, I and mean, maybe Carolyn could, uh, could speak to that a little bit uh, better than I could. Um, but it's what's coming up and who's coming up in the pipeline. I think um, we were just talking about this earlier today, Bill Henderson uh, and his approach of reaching back certainly to college at least. And I think maybe he's also reaching back to high school, though somebody could correct me on that and saying, look, we've got to, if we want to increase the diversity, and this is not tech pop, but if we want to increase the diversity and associates and partners and that sort of thing, we've obviously got to have a lot more uh, law school ready um, people, and then um, people that come out of law school that are then big firm ready. So we, we, we need to, as an industry, reach back further uh, to make sure, well, one, people are exposed to those careers. Do you want to be a lawyer? A lot of people say that. Do you want to develop technology? Can you see these two loves coming to, to, together? I think it's starting earlier in the pipeline. We talk about um, STEM programs a lot. Maybe even it's getting overused at this point. But again, let's go back to the metrics that Joe and Zach and I were just talking about and say, um, our, our, in terms of the STEM, um, the STEM courses and things that are being offered and where they are and how diverse those areas are. And um, are we addressing things like the digital divide as a, I mean, we, we're jumping right into STEM and saying, hey, look, let's teach how to uh, code and, and, and operate and that sort of thing. And we've got to ask, do, do certain families have access to the internet at their house, right? So I think it's that. I think it's making uh, funding available uh, for people to be able to take some of these STEM uh, courses, um, mentorship. Uh, look, we've, we've, part of our model is based on the European uh, system of apprenticeship, right? So we are taking um, young lawyers and we're placing them with corporations and with law firms for two years under the theory that people still need to learn. It's no different than baseball in the minor leagues and uh, taking people that could one day be tech startups or engineers or whatever and pairing them with people where they can get practical experience. Facebook does a good job of this. I have friends that are in high school and they started working for Facebook and some of these internship programs, hardly any diversity in those programs. And so what, what, what the metrics can then allow us to do is say, well, what are the numbers that we want to have? How do we drive those results? And it's funny, I'll go back to Zach's comment. I always say this, and my bosses have said this to me, that um, what we measure ends up becoming <laughs> true. These are the results that we end up seeing. So let's measure the right things that we want to see change. Um, and then let's contribute to them. If you saw the, you know, the George Floyd Memorial yesterday, um, and I think you'll hear this from a lot of black leaders, um, not to make this religious, but uh, Al Sharpton says, look, <laughs> we're not saying uh, let, let, let's turn the tables and let's be 95% in charge and put our feet on other people's necks or any of that stuff. Let's take the foot off of our neck and have an equal chance to succeed. And we're talking about education here. One of the things as a lawyer that I always share with high school and college students that, that, that I get a chance to talk to is Brown versus Board of Education decision, right? Let's talk about education because that is our job training, um, um, you know, playground. When was uh, Brown decided? How many years are we after that? 60 plus years. I'm, I'm not quizzing you guys. I'm saying. 66. Uh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, so we're a long way. And remember the two Two of the things that, that I always leave with every group out of that decision, by definition, separate can't be equal, right? Uh, do these change, make these changes, this was in the dicta, make these changes with all deliberate speed. Tell me in what world all deliberate speed equals 66 years. This is why we have to measure things and hold people accountable because if we do, then we start seeing the changes. Not saying this won't take a long time, but 66 years just to form, just to reform the, uh, you know, secondary up to high school or the primary up to high school, excuse me. Yeah. Well, the thing, so when you talk about metrics, 
Yeah. How, and I understand this idea that you need to have the numbers and then with the metrics will come change. But I think that the thing that is, and you also talked about rage. And I think the thing that is so frustrating and that causes so much rage is that you can have the metrics, but if the attitudes don't change and it's taking so long for them to change, you'll keep thinking, all right, the next generation. It can't be generational. But I don't know if you saw the story about how LinkedIn had a yes. diversity um, event that was online. And in the middle of the diversity event, in the comments, there were all these oh, obtuse yeah. racist comments. Yeah. You know, in, in, the, in the middle of a diversity event, I mean, how is that? They couldn't even be quiet then. And these are and these were people that were working at LinkedIn. And so at what point, yeah. I mean, I think what you're seeing now is this rage overflowing and because it's taking too long. And how do you, as, and I guess I, I also wanted to ask about, I mean, that's commentary. I also wanted to ask, ask about being an effective ally and how you do that when it isn't our, it's our problem, but it's not our voice that needs to be heard. And how, you know, I'm enraged. I think we're all enraged, but you don't, you don't know what to do effectively. And I know the article touches on that a little. So I was kind of hoping you would share a little bit of some of those things, just so that in case people haven't read your article, um, they'll have a sense of some things that can be done, but also just what do you do when you have this rage, but it's not your voice? And how do you be an effective ally um, when really you shouldn't be in the front seat? You should be in the back seat supporting, but not overstepping. I think it's well stated and, and you know, I would say that, um, you know, uh, I don't know if it's a back seat. I think it's maybe right beside, uh, beside me uh, or beside us, um, you know, because certainly we look at the civil rights and a lot of the friends that we have um, as a family, given that my mom was involved in the civil rights are Jewish people, right? They have a shared experience. They walked right beside us. They uh, helped my partner is <laughs> Jewish. She kind of continues. Um, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm saying, that there's a lot of people out there that want this to happen. And so tangibly, well, what, what can allies do? And I know we'll come back to the, to, to the rage uh, point. Um, John, is, after this, like he's struggling himself, right? Like, and he's working through this and he's, he's come up and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, release it soon, is he says, what can I do? This is the question that he's asking as a 65-year-old, uh, I think, hopefully I'm not saying his uh, age, age wrong, but 60-something-year-old, uh, you know, white guy that's had a lot of privilege, that sat at the tables of power, right? Like he was on uh, the policy committee for one of the biggest law firms in the world. He, he always used to make this analogy uh, to me of, of like the country clubs, right? We're all in the, the country club. But if I bring you in, that doesn't diminish. We just have you know more people that are that are helping out. If I can do that and, and hold that door open, um, he's talked about getting into the community, learning what's going on on the ground. Um, uh, obviously, he's got you know he's made um, some means over the course of his career. What are those organizations that are doing the work? Because you guys are all journalists and running companies, and uh, I'm running a company. John is, and then we have some disposable time. But there's people that do this work full time. Um, a, a couple that, that spring to my mind are the Equal Justice Initiative that's led by Brian Stevenson, right? Fantastic work uh, in this area. And then um, related uh, to, to, to them, related, um, sharing uh, some of similar spaces uh, is Cheryl and Eiffel uh, over at the NAACP uh, Legal Defense Fund. Um, and so uh, I think Molly was talking um, in, in going back and forth with, with Bob. Uh, about this technology and the diversity point at the at, at the beginning um, on 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 voting, and so we have an election coming up. The victories that they're going to be able to do and amplify the power that they have because of some of the technology that exists on voting rights and IDs and making sure people don't get shut out. Um, those are things that we can do. So that's that's treasure, right? Um, time. If you're a lawyer, we can take out some pro bono, uh, some pro bono work. If not, what can, because I, I hope, and a lot of people were telling me that um, some of the um, predictions that we had or solutions are applicable beyond law. I mean, you could be an accountant, you could be a psychologist, you could be business, right? I, I was listening to um, AT&T's uh, uh, CEO the other day um, talk about the business roundtable, right? So they can, they can drive from there. But to, to your point um, uh, about the rage, you don't have to be black to have rage, right? You have to have a human being that has empathy for treating another person treated badly. And what I said to, to Irene, what she said to me is, let's get together on Monday. 
I need some time to continue to process this. And I am big on mental, mental, mental health. We don't talk about that enough, but maybe a subject for, for another podcast. But the best law firms you see out there, the best companies now have wellness officers, right? They are doing and pushing things to their employees, physical fitness, um, talking to someone if you need to, identifying problems before they manifest itself. And this is another role for data. When I came in, there were staggering statistics about lawyers and the amount um, that we're, we're going to have an experience with alcoholism. So if we know that up front, why are we not putting in programs to address the mental health that's leading to that substance? So I say to you and anybody else that, that, that's listening, take the time. You don't have to, I mean, Carolyn was saying this a minute ago, you don't have to um, apologize for that. This week, and usually like on the business this weekend, I'm like, I got to sit back mentally uh, and go ride my bike and play with the dog. And then, then I'll have my cup full work and come back and, and do more work. So quickly, there are a lot of voices with an incredible amount of privilege within the law. And I talk about leading from the front. You saw in a, in a precedent setting move, I believe, and we're gonna see it play out in the, in the trial of these officers, the chief of police of the Minneapolis police force fired them, asked why. He said, unequivocally, these are crimes against humanity. What's there to think about, right? And so the people that matter, I said everybody matters, but the people that are in charge of our law firms, our corporations, the tone gets set from the top. So can you call this out? Can you unequivocally say that it is unacceptable not to have more representation look like society? That it's unacceptable not to have more people of color and women heading com uh, committees within the firm, being in the partnership, then we start to measure those. What are specific goals that you would put in? You study corporations that have driven most diversity. The ones that are very successful lay out very clear metrics, and then they put the system of rewards uh, to support what they're driving. So you're always rewarded on a P&L basis for meeting your budget. Well, that's good. If you're driving diversity at Coke or at Hilton, you will actually make more money in your bonus and driven um, by structural change and real data, not just did you hold a, a, a webinar or something like that. And I think <clears throat> um, I talk in there too about going, th so the, the, the leaders, um, the, the um, implicit bias training that we can do um, that's super important. And I made this point early on and I'll just finish with it. Top down, and I've talked a lot about the top down and what the top people can do because they do still set the tone. Um, bottoms up, right? This is our role again for data metrics. It's telling us the story. Look at the data and listen to the people that you're putting in stuff, uh, putting in um, procedures and rules to try to help. Listen to them. They have a voice in this as well top-down, bottom-up, complemented by data. Uh, Bob, I just yeah. one, real quickly want to echo some of that with um, the, I, I think it's going to be really hard for people to go back to work, see mm. lack of diversity and injustices. And, you know, I, I, there, it would be hard for me not to call out um, as a reporter, <laughs> Um, where I see a lack of diversity, a lack of um, justice <laughs> in the system. I mean, as, as you as you all know, <laughs> right. Brian, not so much, but <laughs> I'm I'll somewhat passionate and obsessed with access to justice right now. And and part of that is just this urgency that it's been too long, and we we're creating this gap and this divide and and this systemic problem, this institutionalized problem needs a, need solutions and i i just feel like now going back into the work world as people are going back into their offices how can you not confront these issues like ryan was saying head on you're going to have to have these difficult conversations and figure out how to have them in a civil way and you know make progress in your organizations and i think that's that's all of our responsibility 
I think so too, well, yeah. and, not, and not be willing to wait, right? Like have the, um, everybody says like, stop quoting Martin Luther King, or we, we got other people we can quote, but he, and he, in the fierce urgency of now, that's what you're talking about. I think we've got to be restless. Um, and I just wanted to make the quick comment because I was going back and forth with, uh, with Gina over at uh, ALN, and she was saying, hey, are the, are the law firms the right ones to, you know, to lead on this? Can, can they be a, a bastion for change? Molly, I think you make a great point. What I said to her was, I think it's an ecosystem. I think it's law firms, but they're big, giant cruise tankers, right? Like it takes a lot to turn the ship. Okay, they've been successful. They do a lot of very good things. Maybe um, uh, in, in terms of some of the smaller, more innovative companies uh, like ours in this alternative legal service provider space, um, we have a role of offering some innovation. And then what I said to her, and I'll say to you guys, not to be self-serving just because I'm with a uh, journalist, accountability, right? I mean, the, you, you are best position and maybe the only ones position, nah, not the only ones, but your best position uh, without fear of sort of reprisal, right? Um, to, to, to look and say, um, when, when we are, because we have, and maybe Bob said this uh, at the beginning, um, we, we have uh, the unfortunate incident uh, that has lit the country uh, on fire uh, on top of a pandemic. And so uh, when we're doing furloughs and that sort of thing, are we asking the question, is it um, disproportionately impacting uh, black associates, uh, partners, other associates of, of color? Is this an excuse to pull back on diversity and inclusion initiatives? I think those are the questions that we have to answer and that we have to uh, try to measure in, in our webinar on the 30th. We're going to tie diversity to, uh, to products, I'm sorry, to profitability and cost and try to say, these are not mutually exclusive. M many GCs of the uh, Fortune 500 are saying, if you don't bring us diverse teams, you're not going to get the business. So now we can have a seismic shift because the lack of diversity is going to hurt your bottom line. So not only are they not mutually exclusive, they're tied together, I think, in a very good way. But you, you all will be the ones that write about it and, and, and give it voice, whether it is happening, whether it's not happening enough, whether it's happening too slowly. So um, I hope, I, you know, it sounds like this group is, uh, is, uh, is, is ready to, you know, hold people accountable. And I think we need, we need some of that. I think, well, I think, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Carl. Go ahead, Carl. Oh, sorry. And um, I think that in terms of metrics, I think it's also important to have the long and the short term, isn't it? So, so I was interested in your point about STEM. So I organised a um, diversity of, with regard to women in legal tech. I organised a diversity meeting um, and it became pretty clear. We had this amazing head of diversity for DLA at the time talk to us about the STEM issues and say, look, you know, we can all rage about it now, but actually you have to go back and you have to, do, you have to speak to people at schools, just as you were saying, Brian. Where I think, my, I think the point I wanted to make about that was that, and it kind of relates to what Nikki was saying about whose voice they need to hear. Actually, I think that law firms need to be heavily involved in those kind of programs because actually it's a big time commitment. And actually, if you, if you end up being, if, if people of color end up spending all of their time going back to schools and it, you know, actually that can affect their career. And I think that the law it falls very heavily on law firms to make sure that, you know, that, that actually, I think it ha that has to come from them really, you know, that because actually it's a huge, you know, it's a huge commitment as I experienced firsthand. It's hugely rewarding actually. Um, but, um, but I think, you know, they really need to do some digging, deep digging into short-term goals, long-term goals, and actually really meaningful metrics, you know, sort of how, and um, yeah, I and mean, sometimes it's hard to, to, to sort of commit in terms of results, but, but actually as well, I think there needs to be some kind of commitment in terms of the results that they're looking for with, 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 with educated people like you, yourself, you know, inputting into that. No, oh, I, 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 I don't know if you, I agree with everything you said. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you wanted me to respond to, to part of it. Uh, I think within your long and your short-term goals, so if we can keep our minds on a systemic change, right? Sustain change and then realize you know, this was a point I used to make um, to people in business school, and, and, and this is a crude analogy, so, so don't take it strictly, because of course there are companies in, in the U.S. that do this. But in the U.S., you know, we're looking um, at the next four quarters, right? Like, here's our guidance and, you know, that, that sort of thing in China uh, and, and Japan to a lesser extent. 
they're looking at the next quarter century. So when we go back and we look at economic data, well, economic data, I think, said that China was going to pass this as the world's biggest economy by like 2032 or whatever. Well, they, they beat that by, what, 14, 15 years. So um, I, I think we've got to give it, this is always the difficult change conversation, right? Um, we, we are going to have to, um, be able to take the long view. There's, certain, as you said, with the short and the long term, but our measurements have to tie up to those two and celebrate the victories that we get along the way, but realize that if we're really talking about the next 20 years or so, I think that's what we're talking about. The change, I mean, you know, I don't know how old you are, Zach, but maybe Zach will still be around for that. Uh, I, I, I hope to be hope so. retired and maybe playing golf somewhere uh, by the time that comes all the way, uh, all the way through. But I think it's, it's, it's those long view, and I, I'll go back, you know, to the point that Nikki, I think, beautifully expressed. Is it within the culture of the firm and the current firm's leadership to be and stay committed? Because those are the voices that um, can have outsized influence on this, but they're also the ones that are pulling the levers and making the decisions. Yeah, and I, and I think uh, one other point that kind of pulls together what, what Molly's talking about, what Caroline's talking about, what, what you're talking about, Brian, in terms of the metrics is that I, I think the extent to which you uh, are able to track these metrics for improvement in, in kind of any part of this picture, it spills over into the other parts. I mean, to the extent you're imp helping law firms, uh, you know, using metrics to help law firms improve the way they serve clients and deliver legal services uh, and become more diverse, that spills over into how you address the access to justice gap and to how you improve court services and better serve people right. in that community. Um, and, and ultimately that maybe that starts to help inform even uh, those parts of the justice system, such as how do we better train police uh, to avoid the kind of situation that we've had and, and to make them more sensitive to, uh, you know, avoiding these kinds of issues and how do we better understand how to respond when these kinds of things do happen and uh, how do we inform that? So I think we all have a, a long way to go on this, but I, I, it, it's interesting that I think metrics is, is, can, can really play an important role and not something that people think about a lot. Yeah, and maybe Bob, just, you know, as, as you were going there, because um, we've talked a lot about inside the law firm, um, what are we doing outside with a lot of lawyers that are very smart, have policy chops, uh, do a lot of political giving, so we're connected that way. For the purposes of what we're talking about here, what I tried to say in the article is, let's throw out the labels, Democrat, Republican, Independent. I frankly don't care which, which one you are. Like if we're friends, we can sit around and talk about this, right? But we don't need to have a decision about which party is right. You've got, let's just say there's a colleague that has access to a lot of uh, Republican lawmakers, and I have some on the Democratic side. I think that the question becomes, to your point, Bob, um, are we driving the kind of change that's going to lead to uh, the decrease in mass incarceration, um, things like bail for the poor, um, the chokehold, which that was just another version of. Uh, Hakeem Jeffries, who you know was a year behind me at NYU, now congressman from New York, is introducing a bill that would make that a federal crime. So we can. There's just so many ways that lawyers can show up. And again, it doesn't have to be any of the partisan battles. Like, what do we agree on uh, that can drive some of this? Uh, that can drive some of this change. And, and let's try to do it together. Yep, yeah. um, Brian. I know you. You mentioned uh, you're doing a. A, a program uh, later this month on diversity. Do you want to tell us how we can find out more about that? Yeah, thank you. Um, so um, I, we are. It'll it'll be surrounding you. We try to use uh, we try to use uh, social media, and we'll have some uh, people. Um, so our website is uh, www.legal-innovators. Uh, Dot com, uh, and the registration link uh, will be there, and it talks about the program. We'll be sending it out. 
Um, obviously, I'll personally send the links uh, and background to all of you. If you're, you know, willing to share with your uh, with your networks, uh, that's great. It's not going to just be uh, legal innovators talking to people. We've got, as you might imagine, we've got an expert in data and, <laughs> and analytics that's going to be on that. So uh, Parker Analytics, not related to me, uh, but Evan and I are, I guess, brothers from different mothers, as they say. Um, uh, Locklord, Safar, The Belonging Project, Namwolf. So, um, and on the business side, I think this is important because, uh, you know, I went back and forth with him a lot. He said, don't you want to, you know, somebody in the legal? I said, no. We want somebody purely on the business to talk about this tie-in. And so uh, Sekou, uh, who is a friend of mine, he's a managing director over at uh, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, and he leads uh, their Advancing Black Pathways initiative. So um, we are hopeful that it's going to be um, a good program. And we're going to be there to listen, too. We've made it 90 minutes just so we can interact with the audience. But uh, we'll start by grounding people in the data. We will end by walking away with um, specific actionable items, some in the article, some not, and then talk about this question of how do we get it, uh, keep it going and how do we measure these things over time. So I hope everybody will join. Um, and I'll just say, because I said at the beginning, we are also not trying to be the definitive experts like we know everything. I'll go back to Nikki's uh, uh, point. Can we bring in all these diverse voices and particularly have decision makers that are at the table so that while we're talking about this, um, we can have people that can go back and influence their organizations, whether those be law firms or corporations or nonprofits. Well, we uh, never got to our weekly news roundup this week, but I don't. I, I think this. Uh, I, I think we all agree that this was a much more important and valuable conversation to have had, and I, I think you really. Uh, Brian helped us maybe bring some closure uh, to a to a rough week for all of us, and I really appreciate your taking the time. This wasn't on your calendar, I know, and so I really appreciate your making the time to share your thoughts and insights with us. It's really been great. Uh, well, we appreciate the audience, and I appreciate getting to meet every uh, every everybody here and start to hijack uh, your 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 show. Um, Not at all. Not happy to be at any time. I can come back and talk mm -hmm. uh, about technology uh, going forward if if you want. But I I really do hope you. Uh, uh, all will uh, participate in the uh, in the webinar, and if you have questions that you want to be a part of um, uh, of what we're going to address, I'd be happy to take those. All right. Thank you, Brian. Any yeah. uh, any panelists have any closing thoughts before we wrap up here? I know we've gone long today. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I just want when he, when you said twenty years in the future, I just wanted to throw out there. I hope it's I hope that this is a sign of immediate change or change very soon. I was a public defender from. 95 to 99 and listen we're 20 plus years past that and it's when it comes to criminal justice system and access to justice and we're worse off than we were lsc has been de practically defunded and you know hopefully this is going to be the instrument of a much quicker change and i hope it's not 20 years yeah. <laughs> i hope it's like two yeah. maybe one <laughs> hats off to you nikki and, and i think you're 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 right and, and hopefully it came across clear but if not i do think there's a you know a number of things that uh, we have to show in the short term, but I just, but my point about 20 years is that there's probably uh, some longer objectives. For sure. I didn't yeah. even, I wasn't calling you out on that. I was just like, oh, oh no, no. I, that. <laughs> I think the point is, that's the agitation that we need though, right? Like, right. Are, are we urgent? You know, forget 20 years. Yeah, two. Like, how, how do we, how do, how do we, how do we bring that in? Bob, I, I see that, that you have a lot of questions in the, um, in the, in the chat. If you want to filter those or people are welcome to, because um, I do want to make sure that, that I'm giving voice to anybody that's had something. Uh, my email is Brian, and Brian is with a Y, uh, at legal-innovators.com. So happy to either get answers through, you know, you yeah. or Molly, uh, or answer directly. Yeah, okay. I'm not sure we have questions. Am I missing them? I'm just, cause oh, a couple yeah. of comments, but I don't think we have any Some, pending questions. It was us talking to article. each other. Oh, that was you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Someone wanted to know. That was me talking to myself over there. We, yeah. we did a webinar on, uh, on mediation a couple of weeks ago, and there was like uh, 30 comments, and I'm trying to tell the moderator, who's my business partner, I was like, hey, we got to get the, the people in. So Yeah. No, I, I think people have uh, appreciated just listening to your comments. They were very helpful and insightful, so sure. appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Well, I hope everybody gets out and uh, gets a little bike ride in or something this weekend. And uh, yeah, happy to ride around town. the monuments. Anybody that lives in uh, DC, uh, we can meet out. <laughs> all right. <laughs> guys, all uh, right. Take care. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, thanks everybody, Thank you. and Thank you. Uh, thanks you all, and good weekend. And yeah.
that'll wrap it up for today. Brilliant. See you Thank next you. week. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Stay in touch.